Well, hello again. Uh, I'll try not, I'll try to pretend that I just didn't do another video. You can tell by the fact that I have my Mesa Engineering sweatshirt on, one of my favorites. I forgot that I even had this sweatshirt. Uh, it's very nice here in the cold weather. And also Mesa, for my other guitar players in the classes, uh, you'll know is, a, is an amplifier amplifier manufacturing company, and they're one of my, my favorite companies. My favorite guitar amplifier is a Mesa. Mesa Boogie from the early 1980s, so I, uh, I got this sweatshirt uh, in Los Angeles a couple of years ago at their the Mesa flagship guitar store in, in Hollywood. Uh, but anyway, so I wanted to do the second video uh, here tonight uh, and to say hello again. And this one is, is going to be more specifically on paper number three and on the Harlan Ellison reading. So I'm going to do two things in this video. Uh, I'm going to talk about the story, Paladin of the Lost Hour, and how it fits in, I think, with the Otto Binder readings and the interview that I asked you to read also in the Ellison fold around Blackboard. And I'll talk a little bit about the structure for the paper. I think I'll do another separate video just summing up the structure. Also, the outline for paper number three, as you noticed also in the second paper, is on the directions itself. And it's the same outline. And let me actually, let me, let me start with that. Um, the structure for paper two and the structure for paper three and for four and number five, it's all the same. And I've said this in previous videos, you know, again, you'll have an intro with your thesis. The first couple of body paragraphs of the paper will be discussions of your outside sources. And so in the case of this third paper, that would be the Harlan Ellison interview, because that's where he specifically explains what he got out of reading Bender when he was a kid. Uh, and you can also still use material from Binder. And I, I keep mentioning that because this is a paper where you're trying to figure out what impact Binder's writing had on Ellison because he was reading all this stuff when he was a little kid. He was reading iRobot. He was reading The Teacher from Mars. He was reading that comic, all those Captain Marvel comics that Binder wrote in the 1940s. And so this had a major impact on him, and he talks about that in that interview, which is why I wanted to provide that for you as your secondary source for paper number three, because you've already done some research on Binder. Uh, you read the letter from John Campbell, if you wrote on that topic. You read the essay where he explained why he, uh, he wrote the, um, uh, the Teacher from Mars. Some of you, not as many, also read the letter that he wrote to his editor, Sam Moskowitz, where he, he argued for creating a magazine for uh, younger readers. Now, I've provided you all this information uh, because we're, you know, we're still in the first half of the semester. And in 102, my goal is to kind of get your feet wet first with some of the secondary source material, particularly material like this that, <clears throat> excuse me, you may have never seen before. These really, um, <clears throat> excuse me, often difficult to find archival sources. And that's what part of doing research is. It's not just looking stuff up on Wikipedia or online or only in the library databases. When you're really doing research, um, uh, maybe in your other classes or if, if you're going to go on to grad school, oftentimes you might be asked to do, uh, again, what's called archival research, where you're looking at uh, these old documents, uh, and not just in English. You know, I, I, this would be the case if you're going to go to law school, for example, and you have to look up older briefs on a particular case. Or if you're um, in, uh, for example, a science class, and maybe in the science class they're asking you to do some research on a scientist that you're familiar with, or um, you know any number of other areas in which you might be majoring, you'll be asked to do some kind of research. So I want you to kind of get accustomed to seeing what that kind of research looks like, the kind of research that I do, for example, other colleagues of mine do. That's what we're looking at, those primary sources that we get from archives, from libraries, um, it's the kind of stuff that you used to have to get on microfilm. Most of you, I'm sure, are, are too young to even know what microfilm is. Uh, but that's where a lot of these documents used to be uh, stored on these old strips of, uh, of, ta of well, film, actually, not, not, or I was going to say tape. Um, so all the sources, as I've mentioned, I've provided you for these earlier papers. And the goal for these papers uh, and for the first part of your essays as you're writing them is to engage with those sources. So in paper number two, uh, you had to talk about, you know, either the essay that Binder wrote or, again, the letter that he got from Campbell. And you've done really well with that. I, you know, I, I've read these papers. Or in the case of sections uh, 16 and 18, those two, those classes, those are the ones I'm reading now. If you're in class 15, section 15 or 17, again, you're all on slightly different uh, schedules in terms of when you turn these papers in. Then you already got those papers back from me, uh, depending, again, on which class that you're in. And so the goal with paper three is to keep building on that structure. So as I said, introductory paragraph, 
is your thesis, the introduction to the whole paper. But the second and third paragraphs of a paper like this, and in most college papers, at least as I was taught it and I was trained, was the engagement with the secondary sources, which means that not the stuff you're analyzing. The primary source are the stories. That's Paladin of the Lost Hour. That's iRobot. That's Farwell. That's the teacher from Mars. Those are the things you're analyzing. That's the primary thing, the main thing you're analyzing. And the secondary material is everything else. Everything that you're using to get a better understanding of the research topic you're doing. And again, these are all research papers. They're small, they're short, but you're using these outside sources and you're using the outside sources to understand and to explain the primary subject, which in this case, because we're in English class, happens to be these stories, okay? So for the third paper, it's the same thing. Introduction with a thesis. Second paragraph deals with, in this case, mostly the Ellison interview. What did he say about Bender? What did he get from him? But in this paper, you can also have a paragraph, maybe paragraph three, where you go back and you talk to me more about Bender. You're an expert on him. You've all written about Otto Bender now, right? And so you've already done research on him. And so your third paragraph can actually be a callback to that second paper where you're, you're referring back to some of the research you did. Go ahead and quote from uh, the essay on the teacher from Mars again. Go ahead and quote from um, the uh, letter that he got from John Campbell. And the reason for that is I want you to think of this as, I don't know if I should call it a genealogy or a kind of tradition, think of it this way. John Campbell, that, that editor, that had, that, whose letter you read, hopefully for paper number two, he gave Otto Binder advice. Then Otto Binder published these stories in which he took John Campbell's advice. In fact, most of you that did that topic, topic number two for the second paper, said, yeah, for the most part, he followed Otto Binder's advice. Some, or, or excuse me, Otto Binder followed John Campbell's advice. Now, a couple of you also argued that you didn't think he followed it perfectly. Those also were interesting papers where you said, yeah, there were still some flaws. He could have characterized Adam Link better. He could have characterized uh, Tom Blaine, for example, better in The uh, the Teacher from Mars. And those are great arguments to make too. Again, you don't have to say that he's doing everything perfectly. But all those of you that wrote those kind of papers also said those things because you had read the C Campbell letter. So we saw how Campbell's advice affected Binder. And now what we're looking at is how Binder's writing affected Harlan Ellison. This, by the way, is the book that um, Paladin of the Lost Hour comes from. It's from 80, 80, 88 or 89, I think. Um, it was called Angry Candy. I love the design of this book, by the way. It's, it's, it's actually, if you, if you open it up, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, there's Ellison himself on the back. And then he's holding the title on the front. I always thought this was a great, really smart book design. Um, anyway, uh, so in this paper, you're building on the second one because you're still telling me about Binder a little bit because you're talking about the advice maybe that he got and how that was sort of passed down to uh, Ellison himself. And then in the second part of your essay, you're giving me, again, your opinion of the story. What did you think of it? What did you think of pa Paladin? What did you think of the themes in it? And also, uh, what elements in Paladin did you think come from Binder's influence? Now, there's no right or wrong answer to that. That's up to you. That's your opinion. And, you know, I keep stressing this. Once you get through the first half of these kind of papers, and you've quoted from the sources, and you've discussed the sources and summarized them in your own words as best you can, then you have that foundation on which to give your opinion, as, as well as Ellison himself once said. Everyone's entitled to their informed opinion, and these papers work the same way. You're showing the information first, the research that you did, the reading that you did, and then you're doing your analysis, and then you do your conclusion. So the structure you're probably going to notice of paper three is very similar. It's identical, actually, to paper number two. Now, I just mentioned that theme of ideas and, and uh, memories and influence and advice being passed from one generation to the next. And that's what leads me now to discussing the story. I think that's the main theme of Paladin. I mean, there's this, the theme of friendship is clearly there. Here we have an older man, a Gaspar, who is facing his own death. And now if you take a look at the beginning of the story carefully in the scene where he's at the cemetery, uh, right before he gets attacked uh, and mugged, by those other kids in the cemetery. He's there to visit Minna, his wife, who's, you know, he's, he was passed away. He's a widower. And so he has these memories of her. And because they didn't have any children and he has no immediate family, Gaspar is really looking to do two things in this story. He needs to pass on that watch 
And at this point, I'll just make spoilers. So I, if you haven't read the story yet, you might want to stop this video now and come back until after you've read the story. Okay, so I'll give you time to do that. Okay, so if you're coming back, let's, let's pick up where we left off. So he's got two things he's got to pass on. He's got to pass on the watch. And the watch, of course, we know, if you've read the story, is what keeps everything in balance. It keeps the world from descending into chaos. And the reasons for that are all involved with, you know, how the calendar was changed in the Middle Ages. And I won't get into that in this video because that's, that's in the story and you can read that on your own. But somehow that watch is what's keeping the world from totally descending into chaos, which is why he says to Billy later in the story, there's not going to be a nuclear war. There's not going to be an end to the world. And, and how does he know that? Well, it's because the watch is somehow keeping things in balance. That's the fantasy element of the story. If only, if only we had a watch like that that could keep the world in balance and could keep, um, I guess, human beings from totally destroying themselves. Maybe, maybe it's out there, and I'm not aware of it. And, uh, and um, uh, well, at any rate, that's a symbol that Ellison's using in the story to, to sort of explain, I guess, human optimism and our ability as humans to solve our problems, to work together, to solve issues. It's sort of boiled down into the symbol of that watch, right? But I think the more important thing that Gaspar is passing on, and this is one of the reasons I've always really liked this story, is the memories of Minna. You have to remember, before they go back to the cemetery, at the end of the story, to visit her grave and also to visit uh, the grave of Billy's uh, 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 colleague, his comrade from his rifle company back in Vietnam, is that Gaspar needs to pass on those memories of his, his wife. He wants someone to remember her in the same way that he loved and remembered her. And so one of the high points of the story is when Gaspar starts to share those memories with Billy. In fact, I think the line is even something like, he has passed on those memories to Billy for safekeeping because he's going to pass away himself. And he wants someone else to remember her. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want Minna's memory to die with him. And I think that's a really moving part of the story. To me, that's more important than the watch and all the fantasy elements. Those are cool. Don't don't get me wrong. I think it's kind of a clever story in that way. But I think the first time I read it, that's that's what hit me emotionally was the fact that here's an older gentleman who doesn't have any other family. He's a widower. And his, he just wants to pass on these memories. And so Billy is the one, because of their friendship, their closeness that they develop at the end of Gaspar's life, that he trusts enough to carry those memories forward into the future. But we know, again, if we've read the story, that Billy can't accept those memories. He can't even accept the friendship. He can't even accept the friendship that Gaspar is offering him until what's broken in him is healed, is fixed. And what's broken in him is that guilt. I think today we would call it PTSD. I don't think even in the 80s when this story was first published, I'm trying to remember because as a child of the late 70s and 80s, I should know this. Um, I don't think that term PTSD was used a lot. I don't remember hearing it until the late 90s, maybe early 2000s in regular usage. But Billy is clearly suffering from, from that post-traumatic stress syndrome. He, he has survivor's guilt. His life was saved by that other member of his rifle company, and he's haunted by the fact that he doesn't even know the name of that person. It was someone else in the company. He wasn't friends with them. He didn't know them. And that person jumped in front of him when the, the, the other soldiers were firing on his company, and, and he survived, and the person that saved him didn't. And that's haunted him. And that's why, if you, know, if you read the story carefully, you know that the whole reason he's living near that cemetery is because the grave of that soldier that saved his life is in that cemetery. And so he feels it's his duty to visit the grave, to put flowers on it, to go there as often as he can to say thank you, to say thank you again and again to this person that saved his life. And he can't move on. And you have to remember, this story was only published in... Uh, this book came out in 88. The, the story... I think it was originally published in the early 80s. It appeared as the TV episode that I posted for you in 85. I think the original publication date was 81 or 82, somewhere in there. I'd have to look that up. It was published in a magazine first and then was collected in 88, 89 in this book. Um, so at that point, when the first story was first written and published, the Vietnam War had only been over four, five, six, seven years. The Vietnam War ends officially in 75, right? And so... That's really fresh in the minds of, Amer of of the United States. I can tell you that as a kid of the 80s. Again, 
by the mid 80s, late 80s, we started to see more movies about Vietnam. Uh, the American, our culture as a society started reckoning with how soldiers were treated when they returned from Vietnam. And, and oftentimes they were not treated very well when they came back from, um, from overseas uh, because the war had been so controversial. And, uh, and yeah, it's a, it, that's a whole other history that we could get into. We don't need to for this paper, for this story. But, but, but the Vietnam War was very fresh in the minds. It, was, it wasn't a historical entity the way that it clearly is now because now we're almost 50 years beyond the end of the war. Then it was fresh. It was less than 10 years since the end of the war. And so I think Allison was trying to work through and, and think about what those soldiers had faced, what they had faced in combat, what they had faced back here in the United States when they returned, you know, whether they were able to find work or not, whether they, they were being helped with um, whatever issues they had dealt with. And, you know, I, I have to say, I think that one of the reasons this story resonated with me so much the first time I read it was my grandfather on my, on my mother's side um, was a veteran of World War II. He saw combat in North Africa, and he struggled with a lot of uh, what we would now call anxiety and depression. I know that for, I never got to meet him. He passed away before I, I was born. But I know from my mom and my grandmother and other members of the families that he did struggle with with a lot of what I guess now would be called PTSD after he, he got back from the war, from, from, uh, from being uh, in, in the army in World War, in World War II. And so I think that this was a story where Ellison was trying to grapple with that. How, how, how do we treat our veterans when they come back from, from these, these wars and these conflicts? What happens to them? And I think in this story for Billy, he's lucky that he finds a friend in Gaspar. And Gaspar because he also needs to pass that watch on so that there's another paladin, another defender of the watch, not just of Minna's memories. Gaspar is savvy enough to know that this, this, this young man needs help. This, this young man also needs, needs, needs healing, you know? And so that's where their friendship sort of blossoms. They play with those action figures, for example. Uh, Billy makes food for Gaspar because he realizes Gaspar doesn't have anywhere to go either. And so that's why the story is about a friendship. Now, a lot of you have asked me good questions about how it ties into those ideas of tolerance and prejudice that we saw in the Bender stories. And, so, and a couple of you asked me and then said, oh, wait a minute, I think I know the answer to that. And I'm going to give you the answer if you're not sure. There's a line at the beginning of the story where Ellison, as the narrator, says that one of these men was black and one was white. And then later in the story, Gaspar also says to Billy, when he's trying to convince him to take the watch, that he says, you're responsible enough, you can do this, I believe in you, and I want you also to carry on these memories of my wife. Uh, he says, look at, look, at, look at us, Billy, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Look what color you are and look what color I am. So that's totally embedded in the story, the idea that here's a friendship between a, a white person and a, a person of color and how they're able to find that common ground. And again, think about when this was published. If this is the early 80s, late 70s, uh, we're only, you know, we're a little over a decade after Martin Luther King was assassinated. We're only a, a little over a decade after Bobby Kennedy, was, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. We're barely 15 years after Malcolm X was assassinated. Um, we're, we're, we're only, you know, 20, less than 30 years after um, the, the, the flowering of the civil rights movement in the 1950s. Um, so we're in a period where all those memories are fresh. And so Ellison, as someone that had marched in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, if, if, you know, which if I haven't mentioned before, I'm mentioning it now, uh, because he had those, those, um, those commitments in his own writing too, given how, you know, how he experienced, um, uh, prejudice as a kid in Ohio, then he wanted to incorporate those ideas into this story as well. Right, and I have to wonder if because he did feel isolated as a kid in in a small town in Ohio, as he says in the interview, if that's why this story meant so much to him, you know, because it's again, it's a story of finding good, real friendship, a real supportive friendship, finding common ground, and also finding the kind of friendship which I hope you all have or have had, where that connection you have with somebody else helps you to figure out your own challenges and helps you to feel confident. And helps you to 
fix those pieces that are broken. I don't know how else to say it. I think that's what this story is partly about. And he incorporates, Ellison incorporates, not only those issues of, uh, of you know, the, the, the relationship between these two characters as people coming from, from different backgrounds, different ages, different races, but also um, overcoming their fear, right? Especially Billy, because he's, he is so broken up and he still hasn't overcome the challenges that he faced as a soldier. But Gaspar helps him to do that. And at the same time, he's helping Gaspar not only find the new paladin, and that's the fantasy element of the story, passing on that watch that will keep the world uh, from descending into chaos, but also, more importantly, I think, passing on those memories of Minna, because Gaspar doesn't have anyone else to pass them on to. What else can I tell you about this story? That's the, that, anyway, that's the link I see with Binder, because I think what, what Ellison learned from Binder, from stories like Mr. Tawny, Mr. Tawny's House, that comic story, and uh, uh, the uh, Teacher from Mars, and I, Robot. These stories all have a real sense of humanity in them. It's exactly what Campbell told Bender to do. Make your characters relatable. Make, don't make them wooden. Make them p- that ones that people can relate to. Even if you're writing fantasy and science fiction, give people characters that they can see something of themselves in and that maybe will give them a sense that they're not alone in the world. Ellison, by the way, always said that in a lot of his essays, that he wrote because he wanted other people to realize that they're not alone, that these are challenges that we all face in different ways and that we're all trying to get through this together, to use that phrase that we used a lot last year at the beginning of the pandemic. And again, that's why I chose to start including Paladin last year. I'd never taught it before. I don't teach Ellison very often, maybe because... He means too much to me, and I, I was always hesitant. But once we went into these lockdowns, I said, you know what? I think Paladin might be a good story because it shows how how people can overcome not only differences, but how they can help each other out and, and, and protect each other and find a way forward into the future with optimism and with grace and with some kind of faith. Um, so that's I think that's a theme. Maybe I'm giving too much away about paper number three. I think that's a theme that Ellison picked up partly from Binder, you know, because he loved this stuff so much as a kid. And you read that stuff when you're a kid and it kind of gets into your brain and it shapes who you are and what you're going to do into the future. So I think that's part of the connection between those Binder stories that we read and uh, this Ellison story. Now, before I finish up, um, you know, the next writer that we're going to read after we get through all this stuff is Sandra Cisneros. And in her case, she's not a fantasy writer by any means. I mean, she's a very realistic writer like Dieback, another Chicago writer. And one of the essays of hers we're going to read for the midterm, again, looking ahead a few weeks here, is about her mom and her dad and how they impacted her. So this theme, not only of friendship and these bonds from one generation to the next that hopefully you're seeing in this story, you're going to see in um, in Cisneros' writing. But in her case, it's it's directly in her family. But again, that's something we're going to get into with the uh, with the midterm when we get into her writing. And she's an amazing writer, different in the subject matter than these these writers, but the themes are pretty similar, as you're going to notice. And that's why I try to put all these together so that you start seeing these connections. Uh, and one more thing that I'm just remembering actually now, that was the big theme in Farwell, right? Where Babovich is passing on what he knows to his student, Dybeck, right? And then Dybeck is then sharing that story with us. So it's it's just passing this on from one generation to the next, that kind of continuity, which, um, I don't know, I take as kind of comforting. I think those are themes that we don't read about as much as we we probably should, because I think they're important ones, particularly right now in, in, in what we're all facing uh, together uh, as we go kind of go forward into this into the year here, and we hope these vaccines are coming out. I think that these stories, even though they were written long before, any of this, um, these ancestors of ours faced a lot of things uh, that, that we still are facing. And as a friend of mine once said to me, maybe they've, they found out how to solve these problems. And maybe what we need to do is go back and, and figure out how they solved them in their lifetime so that we can solve these same problems in our lifetimes. I don't know. I think that's one of the themes maybe that, that Ellison's after in, in this in this piece and maybe even in that interview. So anyway, I've probably talked too long. I could talk forever about uh, about this story. I'll do one more video maybe about the outline again, but I just wanted to share some of those thoughts with you, share some of my enthusiasm for this story, and also share with the fact that I really have enjoyed what, you, what, what you've written about in paper number two. I thought that you all did a great job in trying to grapple with some of these ideas using the sources to talk about Bender. So I, as I said in a lot of your papers, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think of Ellison, because we're just building on what we already started in the last two papers. So please email me if you have any questions. I look forward to reading all your papers and to your thoughts and your opinions on these stories. 
Uh, and um, please let me know if I can help at all. And uh, maybe I can pass on whatever knowledge I have. I can be Gaspar. I can. I have a wa- I have a really nice watch my dad gave me. I'm probably not going to give you my watch, um, but it, maybe I can pass on uh, some of what I've learned over the years from writing. Some of which, by the way, as you've probably noticed, I learned from Ellison himself. So um, maybe if 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 anything I can pass on to you originally came from him, which came from Bender, which came from John Campbell, which came from I don't know. It's kind of blowing my mind these kind of lines of of uh, of of succession. Uh, or uh, uh, inheritance or something. So that's kind of the theme of this story. All right. So anyway, I'll see you in the next video. I hope you enjoy writing the paper and reading the stories, and uh, I'll see you later. Bye.